much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Finance and Java Network webinar, kindly hosted with our friends over at NetBank CIB. To make sure that we are live, please could I ask you in the chat to tell us who you are, your designation, and which company you represent. It would be great to hear from you. And while the people are joining, I'm going to give it a few more seconds before we kick off. Numbers are slowly climbing. Perfect. I see Terry Dubé has joined us. Georgina's joined us. Good morning. Let's give it a few more seconds and then we'll be sure to kick off. So I think the biggest, the biggest part of today is that it's the 1st of December. Who would have thought eight months ago that we would actually make it to this point of the year? But we're there and uh, hopefully next year is going to be a bit, a bit better and, and a little bit less exciting than this year was. So I see Botle has joined us, Samaya has joined us. Good morning, everybody. Again, let us know who you are, the company you represent, and your position. So the webinar that we'll be hosting today is a masterclass in asset-based finance. The unprecedented doldrums of the COVID-19 pandemic have shaken many businesses to the core, changing operating models, disrupting supply chains, impacting customer behavior, and encouraging a new way of looking at future capex and overall liquidity management. So today we are joined by Shane Cadles, the head of asset-based finance and fleet at NetBank CIB. So Shane, if I could ask you to unmute and join us and come off camera or come onto camera, should I say? Good morning, Shane. How are you? Thank you, Tamara. All right. Thanks. How are you? Very good on our side. Thank you. As I said, I think everybody's quite excited. We're in December and we're slowly winding down to the festive season. Yeah, definitely. Tomorrow, I'd like to bring up the presentation and then I'll maybe just do a quick introduction before we get going. Sure. I think before we kick off with the presentation, let's run a poll or two sure. and just to give us a good understanding of who our audience is. Sure. So let's have a look. On your screen, you will see the poll that come up. First question is, how will your business weather a second wave of COVID? So one, we manage once, we'll manage again. Second option is we barely made it through the last time. I don't think we'll make it this time. We were able to evolve in the new normal. I'm confident we've got what it takes. And my business closed down in the first wave. I'm thinking of ways to start over. So if everybody could could maybe vote, that'd be fantastic. And we'll just watch the numbers. Can everybody see the poll on the right hand side of the screen? Okay, I see we've got it. People are voting and I see the scale is moving. So let's give it a few more seconds. Very interesting so far. Right, I'm going to close the poll. So basically, coming at 76%, very positive outcome. We were able to evolve in the new normal and confident that we've got what it takes. So that's fantastic news. Um, the positive outlook is definitely a brush of fresh air. Fresh air. <laughs> um, I think let's do another poll and let's learn a little bit more about our audience. So the second poll is, are you planning to finance assets for your business in the coming year? Your answers are, we are definitely expanding through financing and targeting growth. We are a bit weary given the economic uncertainty, but might finance a few new assets. Or we are definitely not looking to finance anything. Now is the time to preserve cash and not take on any liabilities. Um, the polls are moving, so let's give it a few seconds. Also, interesting stuff coming through there. I'm going to give it one or two seconds, and then we'll close it down and have a look at the final results. 
Okay, I'm ending the poll. So the results have come in pretty close. So 38% are telling us that they're definitely expanding through financing and targeting growth. And 46% is we're a bit weary given the economic uncertainty might finance a few new assets. And are these are these polls the results? Do you find them interesting? Is it a shock? Yeah, I suppose tomorrow it's not a shock. Later on in my presentation, I allude to the you know the agility with which businesses have responded to the to the uh, impact of the pandemic. And I think, and I touch on it again later. South Africans are inherently flexible, and we're inherently resilient. I, I guess we have to be. One could argue. So the fact that 76% of the businesses found a way to get through it speaks to that resilience. And I think also to the ability to start preparing to be even more future fit going forward. I think in terms of how close it was uh, between the businesses looking to expand and those that are a bit wearier, it's probably also fairly reflective across certain industries, maybe more than others. A, a definite positivity for the future on the back of what's happening in particular industries and where the country is going, and also the uncertainty that we will see seeing creeping. So that, but neither of those polls, I guess the outcomes, have been that surprising as well. But I think at the risk of, of being repetitive, Kumara, the resilience keeps coming through, and that's always good to see. For sure, and we've seen it over the last couple of weeks during our community conversations with CFOs. And the words resilience and agility come out top every time. So definitely a sign of the times. Yeah. Perfect. Shane, so we will close out the polls. And I think before I move over to your presentation to the audience, what Shane's going to be sharing with us today during this topical webinar is Shane's going to take us on a positive journey of growth and possibility and focusing in particular on asset heavy businesses and fleets. So, Shane, I'm going to start up your presentation. I will Thank go off camera and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Tamara. Thank, thanks, Tamara. It's come up. So, again, good morning to everybody who's joined. And I know especially this time of year tends to get really busy. So I'd just really like to thank everybody who took the time to make this particular session. I hope you do find it useful. We do have a session at the end where we uh, will gladly take any questions. But I think for now, if we could get going tomorrow with the, with the next one, um, we can kick off. Thank you. So earlier on, just in the wake of the polls, you know, tomorrow I asked my view about some of the outcomes and I referred specifically to the fact that South Africans are fairly resilient and agile. and because of our resilience and our agility, I think there's an element of where we sometimes forget as a country and as individuals in our personal lives that there was a time when there was no COVID. And so I refer to that typically as the pre-COVID period. And because of how we tend to adapt and we tend to go on with our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, and even businesses tend to adapt and, and try and thrive in the midst of constant volatility and change. In, in, in a sense, I think we've forgotten that there was a pre-COVID period and, and that pre-COVID period was characterized by a few things um, as far as our economy was concerned. We all know that the economy was battling and effectively we were in many ways in crisis before the crisis. We know that we had high levels of unemployment, a constrained consumer, and that our growth at best could be described as anemic. Um, there were various things uh, being done by government and business, various joint initiatives, and some of them on their own, to try and reverse that. But the reality is that we were effectively in crisis before the crisis. Come round about late February into March, and COVID hit. As we know, it disrupted normal business um, patterns. It disrupted supply chains and operating models. And I think if we cast our minds back, especially to levels five and four, to some extent, maybe three, we would remember that certain industries were shut altogether. Certain industries were operating below capacity. Others were operating in the essential services sector. So they might not have been that badly impacted. In fact, some 
of the um, logistics customers we've seen uh, operating in the service, essential services sector, transporting food, medicines, and so on, saw some increase in their, in their business flows and so on. Then something that we tend to forget as we go about our day-to-day -day business, whether we're going into our offices, whether we're seeing customers, whether we're going to the shopping malls, wearing masks, um, having your hands sanitized, uh, having your temperature checked, and a few other measures that get employed by business on a day-to-day -day basis to, to try and stem the, the pandemic. We, we've, begot, we've also gotten so used to complying that we've forgotten sometimes about the cost of compliance. So the cost of PPEs, the cost of the temperature gauges and so on. And the, the, so you've got a combination of direct and indirect costs that are started, that have stopped, impacted businesses in the last few months that again, because we've had to adjust, we might not have given that much thought, but it's definitely extra expenditure and costs that have been added um, to doing business. Then, then, of course, we've also seen the acceleration of certain trends and efficiency drives. There are a number that have manifested themselves, not just in South Africa, but in other parts of the continent and in the world. But I think the one that often comes to mind for me, if you're looking at the work from home phenomenon, is how many companies where the IT department said, look, at best, we're trying to see if we can have more of our staff working from home. It'll take us a few months in certain cases, especially with the big organizations, the talk was that it might take a few years to get their staff to start working remotely. Once the lockdown was, was looming and the pandemic started really taking hold in the country, what was spoken about in terms of happening over months and years actually happened in a matter of days in a lot of companies, whether they were small, medium, or some of the larger listed groups. And I suppose the lesson out of that for a, a number of organizations as well has been what else could we do a lot quicker that we previously thought could take years. So having spoken about the pre-COVID period and the challenges we were dealing with them um, as a country and as businesses, we had the COVID era and the disruption that that brought. And underpinning all of the changes that COVID brought was obviously point number two, the added uncertainty that that brought. Now, when one takes the impact of a of a struggling economy and the other challenges I referred to, together with the impacts of COVID, you effectively had those conspiring to result in a perfect storm of sorts. And I think our business colleagues and I think our clients can attest to the impact of having um, had to deal with navigating their way through an already difficult environment made doubly or triply more more, more difficult by the pandemic and hence the reference to a perfect storm because all of those conditions once they converged did make for a challenging business environment but it also led to as i said efficiency focus on innovation and maybe just speeded up some some much needed innovation which was required across different industries and in, and in different businesses the reality is earlier on i referred to the fact that because of how we are as South Africans and as human beings in a way, we, we're typically more agile and resilient than what we sometimes realize. We have forgotten that there was a time that we didn't have COVID. And I think it's important for us, obviously not just in our personal lives, but also in business, to bear in mind that we will also get through this. Things will probably be a lot different and we're also hopeful that they'll be a lot better in a number of ways, but there is going to be business and there is going to be life beyond COVID. And, you know, whenever people say when things get back to normal, I'm always a bit more hesitant because I think what we think might be the new normal could just be different. And I think there's a real good opportunity for that new normal, as it were, to be a whole lot better than what we had before. But I think what this opportunity for reimagining and resetting also gives us an opportunity uh, for is for things to be done a whole lot better uh, for businesses to get a whole lot more future fit and for those initiatives that were aimed at, you know, encouraging innovation, doing things better, doing them a lot smarter, that the environment will be a lot more conducive for that. A couple of things that we've seen as, as we've seen changes happen, not just in consumer behavior, but also in, in how companies and organizations 
you know, oper- uh, you know, execute their operating models and strategies. The other day we were on a call with a customer. Um, obviously, we won't name the customer, but they're in um, industrial space. And they were talking about the, the move to a three-day weekend. It, it, it was part of a cost-cutting initiative, but the idea was that they'll save some costs by extending the weekend by a day. So it means that people would effectively over a normal month have a three-day weekend and work maybe four days less for, for a particular month. In the process, the employee will have one extra day on added onto a weekend and the company would, would, would you know, save costs in, in, in the process. And it actually got me thinking about how many of us would, if it's possible, say financially, take up that opportunity and whether you typically take a Friday or Monday. So those are some of the changes that are starting to happen where some companies are looking to have a hybrid model of working from home and partly working at the office, maybe three, three day, two day split. And then, of course, the move to online that we've seen more and more customers preferring to do more of their shopping online and some of the bigger, medium sized and even the smaller retailers starting to adjust their strategies accordingly as people are doing more and more things online. So as we move into this new normal, um, you know, I think, again, the opportunity is there for us as a, as a business community and as a country to start looking at doing quite a few things differently and, 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 and even better as we as we go forward. Thank you, Tamara. If we could go on to the next one. So this slide really was aimed at encapsulating some of what I spoke about earlier on in terms of setting the scene and the context. So we spoke about the fact that the economy had, had its fair share of challenges before we went into COVID. We dealt with the impact of COVID across supply chains, business models and strategies and so on. And I also referred to the fact that in the normal course of running any business, as we know, you've got revenue, you've got margins, you've got expenses. We've also had to deal and our customers have had to deal with the compliance costs involved in adhering to uh, COVID protocols and so on. Now, in an environment where you're not dealing with the impact of a pandemic, Okay, you normally need to deal with revenues, margins, operational expenses. Now you've had, you, now you've got the added compliance costs uh, associated with COVID. But let's let's assume we weren't in a COVID environment, and and any business CFO, the executive, have to deal with revenues, expenses, margins, um, client client markets, and so on, and and the impact of all of that in terms of how liquidity and working capital is managed. What we've seen in the last few months, and again, especially if you roll back to um, March, April, as we were in level five and four, progressively um, moved closer to, to level one, we've seen issues of liquidity and working capital management become even more critical in our customers' businesses. And in some cases that, as we've seen in the economy, how these were managed had almost become a, a case of uh, survival of certain businesses and and the failure of others. And it's become even more critical, as I've said now, in the wake of what we're experiencing with the pandemic. So I think before I go on to the ways in which asset-based finance can assist with overall liquidity and, and working capital management in the businesses, in the last few weeks, a few of my other colleagues had spoken about other solutions that NetBank offers, whether it was overdrafts, whether it was um, assistance with letters of credit, imports and exports and so on. Across NetBank CIB, we obviously have a suite of offerings to assist our customers, you know, in the different stages of their business life cycle, but also in the different parts of their business and so on. And really, the next part of of the presentation is around how asset-based financing can assist our customers with that critical component now of managing the business around liquidity and working capital management. Thank you, Tamara. All right. So I'll go through each of these um, as we as we outline them. Um, so, so I think item number one around how, how asset-based finance can navigate your business through the current storm that we, we, we're navigating our way through and that we will get through on the other end. 
So the ability to match funding periods to underlying contracts or revenue flows. This is something that on the face of it sometimes sounds obvious, but we have seen uh, cases, and we'll talk to it a bit uh, later as well, if, if any questions arise on, on the particular issue. But we've seen instances where customers have utilized something like an overdraft to buy assets, um, which typically could have been fine in sale with three or four years, linked to an underlying contract that the client has, or just the revenue flows that the assets will help generate. And the problem with that has been from time to time, because an overdraft definitely has its place from a short term uh, perspective in particular, but we've seen clients using overdrafts to buy these assets. And for whatever reason, something might have gone wrong with the bank. It may have been called up. Now you're sitting in a situation where you've got to, in, in, a, on, in a fairly short space of time, uh, realize fairly large amounts of, of capital um, to, to settle that overdraft and so on. So we, we have seen that. And as we're able to structure deals with our customers, we're able to look at the underlying revenue flows, the sources of those revenues, where contracts might be underpinning those revenues. And we're able to structure that for the customers in ways where the revenues are matched, uh, where the revenues rather match the asset-based finance repayments. So we, we, we're already able to do that for customers and we continue doing so. From a tax benefit for point of view, a large proportion of what we do uh, from an asset-based financing point of view are the installment sales or the old HPs where the clients take ownership at the end of the agreement and the finance charges are, are um, realizable as tax benefits. What we do for customers wanting any other types of structures is that we you know, engage with the customer and their uh, auditors typically, and typically arrive at structures that work for the customer from a tax point of view and, and so on as well. So that we do on an ongoing basis. The next item, number three, skip payments, is actually a very really topical one at the moment as we're going towards the end of the year. Now, I've seen skip payments um, structures under the different circumstances over the years. Um, but the most common one tends to be either December or January, when most businesses shut down. Um, revenues obviously decrease during those periods. Some companies have to pay 13th checks, bonuses, and have, have an, an overhead or expense structure that needs to be serviced under circumstances where the industry typically from about the 10th to middle of December up to about the middle of January starts closing down. So we've got structures for customers for December and January, which really work well in terms of them not having to make payments um, during those months and being able to cover their expenditure, including, as I said, some additional expenditure, which might, which might be bonuses, 13th checks and so on. So all of these that I'm discussing now are obviously subject to credit approvals and the individual assessments of particular customers and industries and so on, but we are assisting some of our customers with those. Sometimes we have skip payment structures or scenarios which also apply. It could be in certain parts of the country. And I, uh, I've seen this in certain parts of the continent where, I've worked, where you've got rainy months, two or three months, which typically can be quite rainy and might impact certain industries. There we are also able to structure um, you know, skip payments and so on where uh, weather conditions or other factors might impact um, clients' normal revenues, as it were. Delayed first instalment. So typically what we look at here, again, subject to, to credit approval and assessment of the client's business, is paying the supplier or the dealer for the equipment or the assets that we finance, and then working with a customer to get that asset into full working mode or production mode um, at a particular point in time, trying to get the customer to get an opportunity to get the asset to work, then invoice their end, end customer and then make payment to ourselves. So it's something that we typically sit with uh, our customers with from time to time to see what works for them from a, from a cash flow point of view. And it's something that uh, a couple of customers have found have really assisted them. From a VAT repayment point of view, so typically what we do is if we say agree, we'll do a fleet of trucks or we'll do some yellow metals for mining or infrastructure related company we would talk to the dealers or the suppliers of the equipment on your behalf get the invoicing sorted out make sure you're happy with what the pricing is we'll do all of that uh, and, and in fact we already do on our customers behalf we sign up the deal 
And then once the customer gives the go ahead, we make the payment to the supplier. So we take quite a lot of the administration and so on involved in dealing with, with suppliers or dealers. We take that off the customer's hands and, and it's part of what we do. So obviously at the time of paying the supplier and so on, we also obviously take care of that at that point. And what we've structured for customers, again, it's about, you know, it depends on the customer, the industry, and, and the ultimate credit approval. But some of our customers then pay us the VAT back as part of, of the deal structure, maybe in the third month. Some of them pay it back in the sixth month, depending on their cash flow. And some of them choose to just have it spread over the life of the deal, which could be over four or five years. Again, it's, as I said, depending on the, what works for the customer and, and the eventual outcome of the credit assessment. So we have flexibility in how we treat VAT with our customers and the customers are finding that that does work for their cash flow requirements for the business and so on. For certain types of um, assets as well, we do from time to time get approached by customers to look at refinancing assets. Typically what we'd look at there is where the customer has used cash resources to outlay sometimes significant amounts of money to acquire certain assets. And then they do find that Maybe it wasn't the best decision at the time and that what they could probably have done with the cash is utilize it in other parts of the business, uh, maybe uh, take care of certain debt or, or, or use opportunities to acquire possibly a competitor and so on, especially in the client, current environment. So from time to time, we do get asked to get involved in asset refinancing options and we will typically look at the nature of the assets when they were bought. We will obviously look at things like, um, you know, proof that the customers acquired ownership and we would working with the customers see what we could do from a, an asset refinancing uh, perspective. Then we also do get involved in importing assets for clients from different parts of the world. It's actually been interesting seeing, and earlier on I referred to the um, disruption of supply chains um, across the world. So it wasn't just in South Africa, but also in other parts of Africa and and, and and the world and we've seen the dis as those supply chains have been disrupted and we've seen congestion in ports we've seen the impact on some of our customers in the western cape especially on the ability to export uh, certain wine products to other parts of the world and we've also seen how equipments also or assets have also gotten stuck in certain ports in europe and so on but Assuming we, we, and we are already getting back to some kind of normality, but what we do is once we've got the credit approval sorted out and the client has selected the supplier overseas that they want to deal with, we've got a team that deals with the supplier. We make payments when the, once the client is happy on the client's behalf. We deal with the paperwork involved and so on. And, and typically we sometimes import uh, pieces of equipment that gets brought into South Africa over three or six months at various stages because of the nature of the equipment. And once we pay away to the overseas supply and we've done our necessary due diligences and checks on behalf of the customer, we structure these importation deals for assets in such a way that while the asset is being shipped into South Africa and it's being assembled and gotten into some state to start being productive, our customers don't have to pay us any installments instead. They just need to service the interest on a monthly basis. And once our customer and ourselves are both happy that the asset is now in working condition and it can start, you know, uh, positively contributing to cash flow and product, production and, and, and so on, will we do what we call a rollover into a fully uh, fledged asset based financing product and the client will start paying the um, installments then. You can imagine the cash flow benefits as these as the asset is being imported into South Africa of not having to outlay constant capital by way of installments when the asset is not yet earning any kind of revenue. It's something that our customers find uh, value adding to their businesses. It assists with the cash flow. And as I said, we've got a team dedicated to doing uh, just that. I think the final point on this particular slide, and it ties back to the optimal use of, of asset-based finance for, for financing assets is where from time to time, other than the instances where we've seen customers utilize um, overdrafts to finance assets, we've seen customers also sometimes using just 
what we call in banking terminology a term loan to finance um, assets. Some of the difficulties involved in that could include that if you go the term loan route, typically, you know, banks would want to need underlying security. And, you know, taking a notarial bond on either the assets financed or additional assets could be, um, could not be the most cost effective manner to do it. And the way we've structured the asset based financing product is that once we've signed the necessary documentation with a customer, in principle, the assets finance form the underlying security. The reason why I've uh, qualified it somewhat is sometimes what happens uh, with customers is that other than the asset-based financing products or solutions, there might be a few other banking products that you have. And what we would typically do is just tie in all of the um, underlying securities and so on. But in principle, the assets form the underlying security from an asset based financing point of view, meaning that all things being equal, unless there are other banking products or, or exposures, it shouldn't be necessary to take any uh, additional security relative to asset-based finance. But as I said, there might be other banking products in place, in which case the exposures might be a bit uh, bigger and it might be necessary to tie all of them in. So in a nutshell, I, I think in the time that we have, I wanted to just give our, our listeners um, an idea of, of the ways in which asset-based financing can add value to your business, um, you know, especially over the medium and longer term. And as I said, closer towards the end, we'll take a few more questions. But tomorrow, if I could ask your assistance with getting, you know, hearing straight from our customers um, who've had experiences with us over the last few years, the ways in which they feel that NetBank CIB asset-based finance has added value to their business and has partnered with them through thick and thin. So I'll go off camera and on mute while that happens. Thank you, Tamara. Hello, my name is Jacques Kleur and I'm from the Rovers Group. We are a construction and materials company and listed on the JSC. One of our biggest challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic was to preserve our cash. NetBank Asset Finance Department assisted us by giving us a two-month holiday period on our monthly installments. That really helped us to cover our overheads while we could not generate any revenue during the level 5 and 4 lockdown periods. The best part of this is that NetBank CRB approached us and offered a two-month holiday period. It just shows us again how important NetBank clients are to them. We are the only JAC listed company whose main admin office is in Bluefontein Free State. But there's no hurdle for NetBank, CIB, who is based in Gauteng. We still get excellent service delivery from them. The founder of Robex, Mr. Koos Robenhammer, once told me that in the late 1980s, which was well before my time, I was still at school, Robex was in dire straits and about to close their doors. But thanks to a working capital loan from NetBank, Robex managed to pull through and are, are today one of the leading construction companies of, in South Africa. Thanks, NetBank. Hi, um, my name is Sibule Lesonga. Um, I'm the financial director at Marine Roberts Cementation, a subsidiary in the Marine Roberts Group of Companies. Um, as you all know, um, 2020 has been an extremely difficult year, uh, filled with lots and lots of challenges. And as a finance, you know, individual and a finance leader, um, it, the onus was on us to ensure cash preservation and ensure that. Um, there's sufficient liquidity in the business. Um, and to do that, we really looked to um, suppliers, we looked to uh, clients, um, and we looked to our funders. Um, that's where the NetBank asset-based finance team um, came on board. Um, they assisted us uh, immensely on um, structuring deals, um, deferral of payments on you know, existing deals and assisted us with new deals um, through the process. Um, and thank you, NetBank. Um, the processes were seamless. Um,
Shane, hi. So we've I heard, heard a few words from your clients, great testimonials, and I think it really highlights the value that you've added to partners out there. So before we go to the audience, um, I've got a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind yeah. running through them with us. So what I wanted to know, is, have you seen actual examples of where businesses have used overdrafts and term loan to finance assets? Yeah. Thanks, Tamara. I think that's a, a good question and a topical one. So interestingly enough, I've seen those examples, not just in South Africa, but also in other parts of the continent. And I've seen cases where good businesses have been caught short because for whatever reason, the bank at a particular time asked for an, called up an overdraft. Right. And as I said earlier on tomorrow, I think it's important to bear in mind that an overdraft, like so many other banking solutions, has its place in the business, but not for, for purchasing assets, which are typically more long term. I've also seen cases where customers have used term loans as well for asset purchases and, and, and were quite shocked at the eventual cost as you got the additional collateral of special uh, specific notarial bonds and a few other forms of collateral that have to be um, gotten together to, to underpin that term loan. So I have seen cases of it uh, across the continent, as I said, in South Africa, and I've seen the difficulties that that has resulted in for customers, definitely. Perfect. And Shane, you make, you make mention of South Africa. Does Nedbank operate in other African countries outside of South Africa? Yeah, we definitely do. So from a Southern African point of view, we're in Lesotho, Namibia, Swaziland and Zim. And then we're in Mozambique with Banco Unico. Then we've also, with our uh, colleagues in uh, Ecobank, have West and East African representation. So West typically would be Ghana, Nigeria and so on, East, uh, Kenya and so on. So we definitely do uh, throughout the continent, but sometimes just in different different formats and in and, and, and different structures and so on. Sure, so quite a broad footprint, and I'm sure it's growing from month to month. Yeah, and, and we find quite a few of our customers approaching us uh, in SA to try and set up, you know, make the necessary introductions with our colleagues in the other countries and so on. So on an ongoing basis, we've seen some of our customers, as they've expanded tomorrow, asking for our assistance to link them up with our colleagues in those areas outside of SA that I've referred to. Understood. Thanks, Shane. Shane, I think before we start um, looking at other questions from the audience, and again, I encourage the audience, raise your questions. What would you like to know about asset-based finance or challenges that you face? Before we do that, I've got one more poll. So if we can run through that, there's quite a few options. So basically, the question is, what type of asset finance are you most likely to consider? Is it vehicles? commercial vehicles, manufacturing equipment, agricultural equipment, IT hardware, earth moving or construction equipment, materials handling, handling equipment, aviation or medical. So to the audience, please go ahead and let us know. I see it moving a bit. Very interesting. We'll give it a few more seconds before I close it out and have a look at those results. Okay, I'm going to close it out and let's have a look. So let's have a look what took the lead. So interestingly enough, what organizations will be leaning on in terms of asset-based finance is IT hardware. So personally, so that came in at 30%. So personally, that hasn't surprised me much considering we're working from home. A lot of organizations have had to outlay a lot of cash or seek financial assistance to ensure their workforce is obviously geared to carry out their day-to-day -day tasks. And then a tie is manufacturing equipment and earth moving or construction equipment, which both came in at 20%. And um, obviously operations are still happening within and outside of South Africa. Shane, any other comments on these on these numbers? Oh, they, they are quite interesting. I think starting off with the, with the IT hardware, I think it ties back to the changing operating model and more and more consumers um, doing purchases and other online transactions um, tomorrow. So that and the work from home phenomenon. I think those two 
combined. Doesn't surprise me in terms of the impact on the IT hardware and so on. And I think when it comes to manufacturing and earth moving, an interesting article, um, just very briefly tomorrow, an interesting article I read with the CEO of, of a, um, um, they do some mining and some uh, materials um, as well. And he referred to the fact that traveling through the country, you didn't necessarily see huge, large-scale infrastructural and construction projects yet, all right? But what he has started seeing is a pickup in smaller type projects across the country. And he was starting to say that in their business, they're starting to see the impact positively of those combined smaller type projects. So, I mean, it's really encouraging, if especially on the manufacturing and earth moving side, we, we're starting to see that. And I think tomorrow, as we get out of the impact of COVID, and I mean, we started seeing the economy as the economies opened up activity pick up across, across industries. If the African free trade agreement starts getting legs and, you know, coupled with um, government's infrastructure program, which there's a lot of pressure and pent up pressure for that to actually happen. If we see a combination of those, and as, as I said, economic activity picks up, manufacturing, infrastructure-related projects, energy-related projects, and so on. And sometimes, I suppose, we also tend to forget things like infrastructure, bridges, water, sewerage, and so on, are not nice to have. These are things that the country needs to give us the necessary infrastructure and enabling environment to get to sustained levels of growth. And if all of those start kicking in, you know, across a number of industries, you could start seeing that lift that we wanted to see um, going forward. So I suppose these these trends and, and what the customers and, and the businesses have indicated where they start seeing the spending happening is fairly closely aligned to that. And we're hoping the momentum just continues. Yeah, interesting. And Shane, tell me, is there any specific area um, that your fastest growing territory um, in terms of sectors of the economy um, yeah. tomorrow. Correct. So, yeah, we, we've listened to Yako and to Sibu a bit earlier on as well. And, and what we've seen is resilient organizations or those that have carved a particular niche for themselves have almost diversified their operations to include some infrastructure, elements of e in, um, energy, uh, especially on the renewable side tomorrow, elements of infrastructure, I think I said earlier on, and mining and so on. So we've seen where customers have an element of diversity or have certain niches or are fairly dominant, if, if you want, in their particular value chains, um, having come through this well and continuing to thrive. So there's been no one area where we've seen, and, and, and even in areas which might have been negatively impacted by COVID, where companies went in there, being able to be agile, being able to adjust their business models and so on, they seem to be weathering the storm, um, you know, better than others, where maybe change has been a bit slower um, and so on. Interesting. And a specific location or country that's fastest growing for you? Um, so if we start with South Africa, um, we, we've seen, from an asset-based finance point of view, we've actually seen good growth this year, in spite of the challenges, uh, especially, as I said earlier, I'm giving levels five and four. Um, from a country point of view, um, I, I travel the continent extensively, and uh, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult to say now because the full impact, especially if you're looking, talking about a possible second wave tomorrow, would be difficult across countries outside of South Africa as well. But, but from my travels, uh, especially towards the latter part of last year, Kenya and the East of Africa, in East Africa, uh, were showing good, good levels of growth across a number of industries and so on. And they were also trying to make their environment fairly, uh, investor friendly. And in the West, obviously there were challenges in Nigeria on the back of that dependency on, on the oil price there. But a country where I spent quite a bit of time was Ghana. Uh, from a West African point of view, and a combination of a higher gold price, you've got Anglo Gold, the Shante, and a few of the others in there, the higher gold price, um, good cocoa crops, um, oil having been found in the country and so on, and a real enabling environment 
all work together to make Ghana one of West Africa's prime investment destinations at the time as well. But again, we, we're really needing to just see the impacts of COVID and to what extent governments, not just in South Africa, but in other parts of the continent, are actually going to use this opportunity to reset, to make the national the necessary structural reforms to the economy and really make it you know, these economies, um, not just investor friendly, but also where local investors feel comfortable to invest. And as I said, if the African Free Trade Agreement could underpin all of these initiatives and efforts, I think we could be setting, you know, the seat, could see the scene being set for some real sustained growth going forward. Mm, awesome. Thank you so much, Shane. I see there's a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. So if I start looking at those, so one more came through privately, not to the whole group, was from Paris Naidu. And Paris asking, on large CapEx items, what additional security, other than the underlying assets, would NetBank require? Cool. Thanks, thanks, Paris. I think that's a good question, and it does raise its head from time to time. So I think, as I said earlier on, let's start with the basic principle, that in principle, the assets are the underlying security. But from time to time, you have a couple of factors that could influence that. Uh, I think the factors I alluded to early on was, were included if a customer has additional um, exposure with the bank, possibly other products that could result in other than the asset-based financing, but that there's other debt that we need to consider as well. Um, it could be that the nature of the assets could be so specialized that it obviously means there's a bit of a reduced secondary market for that asset if anything does go wrong. So we would take that into account because, Taryn, if you take a step back, what we typically do at NetBank CIB is we assess client applications, industries, assets on their merits. And we actually, by, by following that approach, we, we, we come to a solution that works for the customer, works for the bank and is relevant to that particular industry. So I've, I've mentioned some of the factors that could impact it. And also, you know, where additional security might also be required is if the period of the financing is possibly five years um, and so on. So we take a couple of factors into account in arriving at the eventual structure of the facility, how long it would be for, whether down payment might be required and so on. And it's really a case by case basis. But I think the factors I, I alluded to early on would typically be the ones that influence whether or not additional security would be called for. It's a, it's a case by case basis because we don't treat all our customers, you know, uh, one size fits all uh, in, in line with that approach. We definitely don't. Perfect. So tailor made solutions. Yes. Yeah. Para, I hope that answered your question. Moving on to uh, Para's Pera asked another question. What type of debt? Uh, covenants would the bank also apply? Yeah, typically the same again. So what we would do is assess the particular. So 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 sometimes we have customers who use NetBank for for basically all of their banking, um, Taryn, and that would mean that across different product lines they would have different offerings that they've utilised and so on. So we would again take it on a case by case basis. For the asset-based finance, unless there are sizable other exposures, we, we, we typically haven't always included covenant um, um, uh, requirements and so on. But again, looking across the, 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 the spe spectrum, where customers have other types of exposure as well, we would sit down with the customer, test their, their business again, see what works for the business and for the bank, what industry they're in, what works for that particular industry as well and come to an agreement on, on that particular score. So again, it's not a one size fits all, but a relatively, I'd like to think, flexible and relevant uh, solution that works for the customer, but taking obviously credit principles into account and so on. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. And then I think which also ties in quite nicely, uh, Sife Zile has asked, what is the minimum amount you'll offer for, you'll offer for asset finance? Cool. So typically, uh, another good question. So typically what we try and do in the course of solutioning for customers, as I've said tomorrow, we try and not do once-off type applications. And, and as we understand the customer's business and their 
and their industry a lot better. We try and say, how do we solution for our customer from an asset-based financing point of view for at least the next 12 months as their business goes through its various iterations and so on. So what we tend to do is rather than focus on a minimum amount, what we try and do is say, okay, tomorrow, if your business is infrastructure construction, what does your CapEx look like for the year? What new business do you think you're going to bid for and so on? And say, okay, how do we proactively put a line of credit in place for you so that once the necessary credit um, approval conditions are met and so on, all you need to do throughout the year as you draw down, and our customers like Yako and Sibu, that's exactly how they work with us. When they get onto a new project or they expanding a part of the business, they pick up the phone tomorrow and they say, guys, we now need to draw down. This is the amount. This is the supplier. And typically, we know these suppliers of equipment and the dealers of the vehicles, and we do the rest for them and so on. So just to get back to it tomorrow, so what we typically do is put a credit line in place, and we can all just work off that particular credit line rather than once off, uh, which is a lot more cumbersome for both the customer and ourselves. Perfect. Makes sense to me. Sifizile, I hope that answers your question. Another one that's come through from Georgina is how interest rates calculated when a one month repayment is skipped. Yeah. So, okay. So what we would typically do is we would obviously structure upfront when the pay, uh, skip payments would, would uh, kick in. And then what we would do is when we work out the deal over at Slice, let's, a lot of the business that we do is over four or five years tomorrow. So we would work out that uh, those months where you don't pay, let's say it's December and January. We're in December right now, so I guess it's quite topical. We would work out your am the amortization of your deal over the four or the five years, factor in the fact that the bank's not getting any payments during those two months, and we would just spread the installments and the interest accordingly over the four or five years, having taken into account that those two uh, months won't have capital and interest built into them. So we do all of that up front, agree that with the customer, and it's all transparent. So am I correct in understanding then that that interest rate would be amortized over the duration of the agreement? Can you hear me, Shane? Shane, can you hear me? I think we've got a bit of a problem. I'm not sure if Shane can hear me or not. There might be a bit of a sound issue. I, tomorrow, I think you'll be back with us in a moment. Can you hear me? No, I think Shane's not hearing us. In the meantime, to the audience, please continue sending your questions. We'd love to raise them with Shane. And if we don't get to answer them, we will definitely respond. After the webinar, Shane will be given the opportunity to address those questions, and we will share the answers with you. Let's double check with Shane again if he can hear us. Shane, can you hear me? No. Tomorrow, yeah. I, yeah, the sound was quite patchy tomorrow, but I think I got the gist of it that any other questions that we don't session will be sent on to me, and either myself or a member of my team will definitely help um, address whatever the remaining questions were. Perfect. Shane, if you can maybe just signal if you can hear me. No. In the audience, maybe in the chat, if somebody could just let us know if you can hear myself and Shane or if there's a problem. Okay. Shane, if you maybe switch your video off, Georgina's suggesting switch your video off. We might pick up the audio a bit better. There you go. Let's take it again. Can you hear me clearly now? Just the last two minutes. Shane, can you hear me? No, obviously not. Okay, so apparently my side of the line, Shane is frozen. Hi, hi, tomorrow. Yes, can you hear me? Hi, tomorrow. We just went off camera when the patch, when the comms was quite patchy. I'm just trying to check. Are you back? I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. 
um, seen in the chat here. Our audience is very kindly confirming that Shane, Shane seems to have frozen. Some people can hear us both. So, um, yeah, I don't know where the problem sits. Okay. Okay, what we'll do is we will definitely send the questions on to Shane, give him the opportunity to respond, and we will revert back to you. So, considering the technical glitches, what we will do is I'm going to share with you our upcoming events. So, if you have a look here on when, no, Thursday, we have the Solving Your Reporting Challenges, um, which is going to be hosted by Enterprise Works. So please go ahead to cfo.co.za forward slash events, register for, I think it's the last webinar of the year. We will be kicking off again sort of towards the end of January. Hopefully everybody will be refreshed and ready to hit 2021 with a vengeance. So again, thank you to the audience for participating. And to Shane, thank you for joining us from NetBank CIB and sharing all your insights. We really do appreciate it. And again, to the audience, apologies for the few technical glitches, and we will see you soon. Have a fantastic afternoon, everybody, and stay safe. Bye.